We'll see a few people will probably trail in. This is, um, welcome, this is the Russian riddle session. We're going to talk about Russia and investment and current, the current state of economic reforms. We have a very nice panel today. I will introduce, I'm going to introduce everybody and then um, ask a few questions. To my far right is Leila Shetstova, who is a senior associate with the Carnegie Foundation, um, which is a Washington-based think tank. Got about a half a million dollars from UCOS last year in, in funding, I think. Uh, Alain Belda, uh, the chairman and chief executive officer of Alcoa. And then to my immediate right is Bill Browder, who runs the Hermitage Fund, which is a large portfolio investor in Russia. Um, here we have um, Vladimir Rishkov, who's a member of the State Duma. And then on the far left, Alexander Zhukov, the deputy prime minister of Russia. I'm going to start with Mr. Belda. Um, you've made a recent rather sizable investment in Russia, um, uh, some rolling plants employing about 13,000 people, 7 million in sales. What, did, what, what went through your mind in terms of risk assessment uh, when you were making that investment? Well, uh, first thing is we invest in many places in the world, and uh, for sure these were uh, good equipment, was uh, good potential. Uh, in, incredibly good people uh, with well-trained tra and, and uh, uh, good capabilities. Uh, we think that this is a plant that uh, eventually, as we bring in our technology and uh, knowledge access and train the people, uh, could triple or quadruple in size. And uh, so it's, it's a good financial opportunity. Uh, the, the important decision also was uh, about the political climate in, uh, in Russia. Um, we operate in, in many, many countries who are at different stages of earning their democracy. Uh, you know, with few people in the world believe that you can just copy a book and have one election. The rest of it have to earn it over years. Uh, and I think uh, Russia is well in that process. Uh, we, fi we find that that will pro promote the growth of the internal market, uh, which uh, we want to participate in, and also as a very good base for export for our products. Um, we, we bring to these uh, places usually uh, our values. Uh, they're very strong. Uh, they have been tested for over 120 years in the most different places in the world. Uh, we think, uh, we, we know we can live them in uh, Russia uh, and that we can improve the communities in which we work, which is part of our objective. In good communities, you have good business. Our, our proposition is we will invest, we will make uh, the best we can for the communities and the country, uh, and we expect that that should uh, drive good business not for today, but for the long term. So it's a long term investment that we've taken here. And you weren't concerned about property rights when you were making this? I'm investment? sorry? You were not concerned about property rights when you were uh, making this investment? Not in this specific case. We've taken all the normal precautions that you need to take uh, and, and was approved by the highest level in the government. Okay, Bill, we've talked off and on for a long time about Russia and investing in Russia, and I know right now you feel there's a bit of a crisis in confidence in terms of the markets. Markets are not up as much as economic growth and the oil price would suggest. What's going on? I mean, and, and what, what can be done to change that? I should start out by saying that normally when I go to international conferences, I complain about Russia, um, but this is one of the few ones where I'm actually going to um, tell you something nice about Russia because I think the um, the mood is incredibly bad. I, I, I've been coming to Davos for five years and um, I think that, um, and I, I come here and I spend a lot of time talking to people about Russia, talk to investors, talk to journalists, talk to bankers, and I think there's the biggest gulf right now between um, what's really happening on the ground and what people's perceptions are that I've ever seen. Um, it can be demonstrated um, uh, quantitatively, if you look at the performance of the Russian stock market, which was up 8% last year, which um, might not sound terrible, except that um, uh, oil prices were up 32%, and some similar countries like 
Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates were up 85%. And so there's, so Russia underperformed probably by 50%. There are, there's three things that, um, actually four things that, that, that has, have caused people to completely lose their sense of bearing about Russia. One is, is obviously Yukos. Um, two is, is how the Russians handled this election in Ukraine. Uh, three uh, is the end of the ele popular election of regional governors, and four is the stalling of a couple of key reforms. And each of these things in their own right is not good, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't come here and say any of them were good, but what I would say is that the, the conclusion that was drawn by many people and by the press to these uh, events has led to sort of uh, an extreme pessimistic reaction. And let me just sort of summarize what, what people think. They say Yukos was a nationalization, therefore there is a renationalization program taking place and therefore everything we own is not worth anything. Um, Ukraine, um, Russia was fighting with America, must be a new Cold War. Um, on the regional governors, it's the end of democracy in Russia. And on, um, on reforms, a couple of stalled reforms must mean that there are no more reforms that are gonna happen in Russia. And I think the extreme reaction um, uh, is just not correct, but that is what the market thinks and that's what people are basically making their decisions about Russia at the moment on. Um, just to go through those four really quickly and then I'll let other people talk. Um, as far as Yukos goes, um, uh, Yukos may have been ugly, it may have been um, unpleasant, but it was absolutely and clearly the result of one guy's decision to take $15 billion of illegitimately acquired wealth and use that to try to empower himself in an unelected, um, powerful position in government. And Putin set out to move Russia from a, a Somalia-like country run by oligarch warlords to a, an American-style country with a central government, and it was unacceptable to have such things, such uh, people using their money to do those things. And so w whatever effect this had, um, he, was, he wasn't gonna allow it to happen. And whether, you, whether we disagree or agree on, on whether that was the right thing, and I, I'm sure lots of people have a lot of different opinions here, um, the one conclusion that one can draw if one understands and has studied the whole situation um, is that this, this was absolutely clearly a, a specific fight over a specific set of issues and it wasn't the government's desire to renationalize Yukos. It was their desire um, for Michael Hordakovsky not to have Yukos. Um, the other important thing in terms of concluding that, it w that this is not the beginning of a renationalization program is that um, there's no other oligarch in Russia that would be stupid enough to step up and try to do the same thing as, as Michael Hordakovsky did. If one looks at all of their tax payments at the moment, you can see that they're all have anywhere from 20, they're paying 20% more tax to 400% more tax than they paid in previous years, as everybody understands that it's no longer acceptable not to pay your taxes. So on Yukos, I don't believe it's the beginning of a renationalization program. I think it's a one-off, and if it's true, if I'm correct, then, then a lot of this fear and hysteria is, is overplaced. On Ukraine, that's much easier. There is, the, 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 Russian, the Russians haven't rolled tanks into Kiev. Um, Yushchenko just visited Moscow. Putin is meeting with Bush in Slovakia. There is no new Cold War. On regional governors, this is, this is one that everybody has gotten all, all exercised about, and, and um, if I went, uh, if I looked at my high school civics textbook, I'm, I'm sure um, it would say that, that um, uh, one shouldn't cancel regional governor elections. Um, but unfortunately, um, that's not the reality that, that Putin was working with in Russia. He was working with reality where um, 71 out of 89 regions um, weren't managing their budgets properly and were in deficit. In some cases, as much as 50 to 100% of their budgets were in deficit. Um, Equally, um, I, I, we were able to just, in a, quick, in a quick and dirty research, we were able to find nine out of 89 regional governors who've been indicted for fraud. And I bet you there's about uh, 50 out there if you scratch the surface. Um, you know, the, it, whatever, whatever the, the greatness of, uh, of uh, having popularly elected regional governors, you know, you need to start from a, a, a reasonable base of, of, of normal functioning, and that wasn't the case. 
And then to finish off, people are saying that reforms have stopped in Russia, and that's just untrue. There are demonstrations going on in the street right now um, about reforms that are biting into people, the social security reforms, and I think it's just an, uh, a crazy conclusion that people have come to. So to, to summarize my position, I think that none, of, none of these things that have happened could be described as good, but if one looks into the details and sort of gets beyond the emotion of them, um, the, the sky is not falling in Russia, and, um, and there are, are uh, it, it, it still remains um, uh, an, a, a normal um, place to, do, to, to invest in with lots of risks, as it always has, but it's no worse um, and no better than it's been, say, let's say, three or six months ago. Leila, both our first two um, speakers here have given a fairly positive view and tried to correct some what they see as misunderstandings, mainly of what has been promoted in the press. What's your point of view? Is, this, is the UCOS a one-off? Uh, should we be worried about anything? Is it a step forward, backwards? Well, uh, thank you, Janet, uh, for the question. And uh, I have a very weird impression, as if you are talking about different countries. Of course, uh, I'm very glad when people are doing fine, and I wish our business people real success in the future. But uh, the question may be raised, either economic analysis differs from political analysis, or how we could explain the fact that during the last year, only legal capital outflow from Russia has tripled, and illegal capital uh, outflow from Russia has raised 50%. You know, I'm not that experienced in the economic sphere, but from my crude point of view, it seems to me we have two conditions for the business in Russia to prosper. One condition, necessary political blessing on the part of the highest authority. Not governor anymore, but the highest, the highest in the Kremlin. Because you know we have this presidential verticality. And the second condition for the business to prosper, it seems to me was very nicely put by uh, Mr. Belder. We took all normal precautions. And of course, we will be very glad to hear what normal precautions in Russia would mean. But anyway, I am very glad when other people are having success. The only thing is that Mr. Putin is not that optimistic about business environment and state of economy in Russia. And Putin's uh, conclusion about economy differs from the point of view that has been represented so far. Just several days ago, President Putin has stated, Russia has failed, has failed to diversify its economy with all negative consequences, he added. General prosecutor in Russia has said, Russia has endemic corruption, no normal rules of the game in the economy, public life, etc., etc., etc. So, you know, uh, people from the Kremlin administration are much more critical of uh, economic performance in Russia. And if you take into account the fact that Russia's economy failed to be diversified, we can make a very uh, cautious conclusion that Russia is a petro-state with all characteristics of this petro-state. Fusion between business and power, social disparities, Mr. Browder, by the way, a little bit uh, touched upon this issue, uh, uh, vulnerability to external shocks, well, and so on and so on. But there is only one thing that I would like you also to pay attention to. Russia is not only a petro-state, but Russia, being a petro-state, wants to be a superpower. Quite a weird schizophrenic hybrid with all strange possible consequences. Well, but uh, uh, maybe uh, my, my, my colleagues uh, at the panel will elaborate about normal precautions for the business activity in Russia. I would also address you as a recommendation, maybe someone needs a recommendation. A recommendation um, put by Helsinki, Sanomat, and Finnish Russian Chamber of Commerce. To all those who operate in Russia, this is a very useful book in Finnish and in English. The book says, what should be taken as a normal precaution in Russia? And I address you to this book. That raises the question um, uh, very much what the government should be doing to change perceptions, whether the government has done enough and should go farther, 
or whether we're really dealing with something that's been kind of status quo in Russia for the last three or four years and things only look rosy because the oil prices are high and there's uh, not a budget deficit. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, Rishkov, could you give us your view? Если позволите, я буду говорить по-русски. Прежде всего я хочу сказать, что я совершенно согласен и с господином Бельда, и с господином Браудером в том отношении, что Россия по-прежнему страна с огромным потенциалом, и что мы должны все сделать все возможное для того, чтобы она становилась как можно более привлекательной и успешной. И, кстати, хочу поблагодарить компанию «Алко», компанию BP и многие другие компании, которые осуществляют крупные и большие инвестиции в Россию. Надеюсь, что список таких компаний будет расти. And uh, we have to look at not, not, not only what is, what is being done correctly, but also what is not being done correctly and what needs to be corrected and what needs to be changed. And there are three points I would like to make in this connection. First of all, it seems to me that today the Russian leadership has lost uh, the strategic vision of how to run the country. And secondly, as a result of this loss of a strategic vision, the situation in the country is becoming less and less stable or more and more unstable and more and more crises are emerging. Thirdly, the political system created in the past five years is incapable of reacting to these crises and making the necessary changes in policy. Now, a number of arguments. If you much that is positive has been done in these past few years. Our gold and currency reserves have increased. The inflation rate has been brought down. The government is each year, and we approve this, is running a surplus budget, which is being unswervingly carried out. The tax burden has, burden has been reduced. But strange to relate, all of these reforms are being undertaken by just one part of the government. Another part of the government seems to be working to counter or to, to undo these reforms. Let me give you some examples. When one part of the government is striving to enliven the, uh, the stock market, uh, the other one is undermining UCOS. Uh, if you look at the uh, stock market in recent years, it hasn't grown. If you compare it with India, Brazil, China, and so on, there's been no growth in the, uh, in the securities market. And then uh, on one part of the government is reducing taxes. Taxes. And yet another one, another part of the government, is um, issuing billion dollar, billions of bills to, uh, to companies. And there has been a fourfold increase in the outflow of capital, for example, when compared with uh, earlier years. Whereas one part of the government is calling for liberalization of the economy and the de demonopolization of the economy, the other part of the government is taking assets uh, into the hands of the state from uh, to state monopolies. If you look at the degree of monopolization of the uh, the economy, uh, is more than it was. It's higher than it was five years ago. And that's not me saying this. The reforming part of the government, which uh, which um, links to Zhukov, is finding its efforts being brought to naught, whereas another part of the government, which evidently has different views, has evidently has a very different view of the situation in Russia. The result is, that you, result is a Russian paradox. We've heard that there, there was much panic about uh, UCOS, about the situation in Ukraine, and so on. But look at other factors, too, which are bound to put us on our guard. The, the Russian paradox is that the quantitative indicators are getting better, but the qualitative indicators in these past five years have got worse. For example, the level of corruption, the degree of corruption, uh, has increased rather than declining in the past five years, according to independent surveys. Uh, and other uh, social tension is also increasing. If we look at the demographic situation in Russia, this too is, continue, is deteriorating. The, the population is declining by seven or 800,000 people a year. Life expectancy is also declining. Um, we are with the 107th position in the world, in the, in the world tables. If, if we look at a whole series of international ratings, such as the in, investment uh, attractiveness, uh, competitiveness, and so on, 
Now let's look at the institutions. Unfortunately, the courts uh, consider, consider to con continue to be uh, plaything in the hands of uh, officials. Uh, the situation with the courts is catastrophic, and this is not my uh, evaluation. So the institutions are being undermined instead of being supported. The role of the parliament, for example, has catastrophically declined. Confidence in the government has catastrophically declined, as has confidence in governors and mayors. All institutions are suffering a loss of confidence. The, the prosecutor's office, the militia, the parliament, and the only institution which is continuing to be supported by the people is the institution of the presidency, President Putin himself. And the support for the president himself fell by 16 percent uh, in the first part of the year and has reached its lowest level in the, in, the seven, in the five years or so of his presidency. There is no effective protection of prop property. There is no proper protection of contracts or of human rights. And there is arbitrary action by public officials, and it continues to be the sort of country where that is true. I'm not even talking about democracy, but just in the last five years, the leadership of the country has liquidated all the factors which would make it possible for a democracy to function and to exist. Television has been brought under state control. Uh, there is de facto censorship, and our television is is mm, ceasing to be European. Uh, business is de facto prevented from financing the opposition, and it is being made as difficult as possible to create new parties or to hold referendums. Effectively, there is a one-party parliament in Russia today and a powerful propaganda machine which has been, which you normally find in authoritarian, not in democratic countries. And uh, the, the president, and I agree with Bill on this, five years ago, the president said that the main task was to strengthen the state, to consolidate the state. But strengthening the state means, first of all, strengthening the institutions of the state. But what's happened is a, a strengthening of bureaucracy. And these are entirely different things. Strengthening of a bureaucracy and strength, strengthening of institutions, those are totally different things. So to sum up, there is a systematic, a systematic uh, uh, mistakes are being made. I would say that what happened in Ukraine isn't just an error, it's a systematic mistake. And there are going to be dire consequences for this. For example, monetization of benefits. Uh, we are seeing tens of thousands of veterans and pensioners out on the streets to protest the, uh, the, the changes being made in the system. There needs to be a there is no longer many means of democratically correcting the political course which is uh, undertaken. As a result, instead of uh, democratic modernization, or even a, an authoritarian mo modernization, which many people had hoped for, uh, along the Chilean lines, the lines of Chile, uh, so that there could be uh, literate economic and social reforms, what, we've, what we seem to be getting is authoritarian, uh, an authoritarian regime without modernization. Um, more along the lines, lines of uh, Venezuela. So uh, we can only hope for brilliant results against all this background. Thank you. Mr. Zhukov, I think that there is a sort of schizophrenia about Russia. Um, one step forward, two steps back. Uh, are we nationalizing? Are we not nationalizing? If you're a businessman in Russia and you're Russian, um, you know, how do you avoid getting into a Yuko situation? You don't donate to any political parties. So, so where is your ability to, to voice your uh, opinion or your support with, with uh, money? Um, can you clear up some of these questions that we've had? I know you wanted to, to uh, speak last because everybody was raising lots of different issues. What, what really, it, start with the property rights and the Yuko situation, the renationalization or not, what is going on there? Good afternoon. Well, Yes, there is this, this is a dangerous disease and it has to be treated, has to be cured. Uh, let me begin by replying to the main question raised in this session, which is what is the response to the Russian enigma, if indeed there is a Russian enigma? 
Uh, I think the answer is very simple. The Russian government, which exists, and it's, there's only one government in Russia, and there's only one president in Russia, and I think the reply is very simple. Russia sees itself only as a democratic and civil society, only as a country, a country with a competitive economy, and it doesn't see itself in any other terms than that. That is the simple answer to the Russian enigma. In reality, all the institutional, economic, and social reforms which are being undertaken in Russia today, and in my view, those reforms which are being undertaken in Russia today can serve the only analogy we can find in our history is in the reforms of the early 1990s. Reforms in the social sphere are just as necessary and just as painful as the vision of, uh, the, of free pricing that was uh, the vision of the early 1990s. And the reforms, which are the market reforms, which are underway in Russia today, uh, we haven't seen until recent, we haven't seen in recent years. All these reforms in, in, in Russia are, pursue one single aim, which is the aim of raising the quality, improving the quality of life for our citizens. We understand perfectly well that we are without a democratic society, without market reforms, without integration into the world economy. Russia will n never be able to raise the living standards or the quality of life of our citizens. That's the first point. Secondly, let me say that high rates of economic growth, which we've seen in the past four years, about 7% a year, and in 2004, the growth rate was also about 7%. These high growth rates are the result of market reforms in Russia. In, in these years, just in these years, we've made We've made, of course, made good use of the of the favorable world uh, situation and the high oil prices, uh, and the policies that have been pursued in these years uh, have been based on our, our making use, taking advantage of the fortunate uh, economic situation, uh, and to tackle the social and economic crisis, to build up some substantial reserves at the same time, and to exclude, to preclude the possibility of a situation where there could be, again, uh, any kind of a natural crisis or default, uh, such as there was in 1998. I don't think anybody has any doubt that Russia today is a, is, is a reliable partner and absolutely a, a country perfectly able to pay its way with high ratings, according to the two principal ratings agencies. And also, I hope we shall get a good rating from the third one as well. And the investment climate is, is better than it was back in the 1990s. Uh, the rate of growth of investment today in Russia considerably exceeds the growth in GDP, and that includes uh, foreign investment. Many people ask the question, what will happen if oil prices fall? And I think that the, uh, our macroeconomic and uh, other policies are enabling us to build up reserves that will create the confidence that even if there is a decline in oil prices, if it goes down to $15 a barrel, uh, that was the lowest level I think we've seen in recent years, and that's extremely improbable, but even if it were to go that low, there isn't going to be an economic decline in Russia in, in consequence. So far as that goes, then, I think I can answer unambiguously that as of today, we are protected against economic crises. And that is the merit in the first instance of the financial, and, uh, financial uh, policy pursued in earlier years. Now, as to our intentions for further reform, Yes, in reality, the Russian economy does continue to be very much dependent on the world economic situation, and half of economic growth is ensured by the high oil prices. We don't like that situation very much, and we understand that we need to 
activate a whole series of reforms. First of all, reform of the administrative system, which in Russia today really is extremely ineffective or inefficient. And we intend to tackle this problem uh, by withdrawing the state from the economy as far as possible, to withdraw the state from spheres where it isn't necessary, where it is superfluous. That is what the administrative reform in Russia is about. There could be no question of, of any nationalization or any increase in the participation of the state in the economy. That's not what this is about. In our program up to 2007, we plan to privatize all enterprises which are not directly carrying out the functions of state administration. We really are talking about the privatization of something like three and a half thousand joint stock companies and about 8,000 state enterprises. This is one of the government's priority programs. Secondly, demonopolization. Yes, the Russian economy is quite highly monopolized. That continues to be the case. But, we, but, but you should look at the trend, look at the direction in which we're moving. Even, even the demonopolization de 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 of natural monopolies where the state was fully in control previously. Look at the railways, for example. Already today, the Russian railway system is a state uh, is a, um, a joint stock company and a con and uh, if we look at uh, and and much of the freight carried on the railway system is is now uh, in the competitive sector we ha we are demonopolizing this sector and the same thing is true of electricity in our plan up to 2006 we are, we will create generating companies so part of what was previously a wholly monop monopolistic market will become in part competitive. Um, this is going to apply to, to Gazprom, and this too is going to take place, I think, in 2005. Perhaps the most painful question that has been touched upon today is concerns taxes. And let me explain to you what is happening with what has happened in the recent years with taxes. In the 90s, we had very high tax rates and a complete uh, tax evasion, refusal to pay taxes. Uh, we had off sh everything moving offshore and so on and so forth. We've removed almost all the taxes. The tax on physical persons of 13 uh, percent, the profit tax, tax on the profit of enterprises. Uh, we've considerably reduced payroll taxes. And we intend to reduce uh, VAT. The tax burden in Russia is already lower than it is in many European countries. But at the same time, naturally, we are demanding that there should be full payment of taxes. Many people have understood this and have restructured and started uh, structuring their tax payments differently. Some have not yet understood these changes and are continuing to employ various offshore arrangements. Uh, these, these are still being made use of. But I can say that we shall continue to tighten up the tax administration, the administration of taxes. We are reducing the taxes, but we are toughening up the administration of the taxes. Our tax legislation, unfortunately, continues to contain a number of uh, obscurities uh, uh, unclear areas which make it difficult for the tax officials to administer the system. We are changing the approach. We are clarifying our tax legislation so that it will no longer be so that it will no longer be possible for uh, so that it will no, the officials will no longer have difficulty in dealing with companies. Uh, the actual the procedure for uh, undertaking tax verification or tax checks is also being uh, modernized and clarified. Uh, and there's going to be better protection against improper action by the tax inspectorate. And we're going to categorically insist upon uh, and, and on, on cutting off all possible ta uh, means and methods of tax evasion. So much for uh, those subjects. Finally, coming back to the social reforms, reforms in the social sphere. Yes, in Russia for 14 years we feared to set about serious reforms in the social sphere. But can there be a normal economy where half of the country's citizens 
uh, use public transport free of charge, not paying a single kopeck for public transport? Is it normal in any country's economy that more than half the citizens should pay they should pay nothing for their flat, for their accommodation, for their communal services, and so on and so forth. These are leftovers of the socialist system. This is something which makes it impossible to conduct normal market-based uh, relations in a most important sphere. But of course, people in Russia have grown accustomed to this. This is the heritage. This is the heritage of our, of our socialist or our communist past. And we are trying to change people's attitudes, to change people's attitudes and their mentality. And of course, that's a very difficult part of the aspect of the reform. And that's bound to drive down public approval of the government. This would happen in any country, in any government. But without these reforms, we're unable to move ahead. This has to be understood. And you should, there shouldn't be any speculation on this. People sh shouldn't uh, say that there is lack of trust in the government or lack of confidence be because the reforms are not being carried out. After these reforms are being completed, people will then feel considerable relief. The quality of the services which they will receive in all of these spheres, which to this day had not been reformed, and it's an enormous sphere in the Russian economy, these improvements are going to make it possible for us to, to have a qualitative breakthrough in very many areas areas in which we were unable to move ahead in the past. This is something people, people really need to understand. And I think many of those who are at work in, in, in Russia, I heard yesterday, for instance, from people who are really are working in Russia today, they're beginning to understand this, uh, these issues. And in com completing my remarks, let me say once again that Russia will, as it has done in the past, will do everything possible will bend every effort to ensure that it is integrated to the maximum extent possible in the world economy. Uh, we are going to be joining the World Trade Organization uh, in this year, and in our plans include bringing up our enterprises to international standards of accounting, international accounting standards. That's something else we plan to do this year. We want to bring our we want to, we want to uh, comply with the standards set by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, according to which all economic indicators in our country will be brought into line with world practice, uh, which, uh, which is followed today. In conclusion, therefore, let me say that if anybody today believes that that there is a possibility of choosing either one of two directions, either moving towards the development of democracy or a possible move towards authoritarianism. Let me say that we don't see such an alternative here. There's no question at all that Russia will remain a democratic country and will endeavor to the utmost extent to join the world economy. Thank you. I think there's probably a bit of relief when you said renational. There's no question of renationalization and some understanding that you're going to be reducing taxes but tightening up the tax loopholes. But can you just tell us, really, are you saying that the Yuko situation, that very messy seizure of the main production asset, that's a one-off? That's a one-time event, it's very specifically aimed at the um, majority owner of that company? Well, in my reply, I, I tried to be very clear in stating our position as regards companies which are evading uh, the payment of their taxes. Okay, thank you. Uh, in other words, they weren't paying their taxes from your point of view. Um, can we, Leela, did you want to say something? Well, if, if I may participate in the discussion, uh, I, I shall continue in Russian. I, I, I don't think the previous speaker needs any kind of PR work from me, but uh, he's the most, dis most respected member of the Russian government who, who yet does not enjoy very high ratings in society, and yet 50% 
percent of the Russian population considers that the government is not effective. And the, the, so the problem is, why, if uh, the reforms are being carried out, why do 52 percent of Russians consider that Russia is in a blind alley, whereas only 35 percent of Russian, 35 percent of Russians, believe that Russia is moving in a normal direction? Vice Premier Zhukov uh, really has held out the hope that following reforms, R Russia will feel the positive impact of these reforms. But the only problem is, how is a considerable part of our population going to hang on until the reforms have been completed? How can they wait for the end of the reforms? And, and a further question, if the reform process does go forward normally, why is the population so seriously dissatisfied? Uh, and it, the reason is not just economic. The, re, the government is not seen as being responsible or taking responsibility for the results of its economic mistakes. I think the main reason f for uh, it's the politics, stupid, as, as President Clinton used to say, uh, and uh, hyper-centralization, if we look at it from the political point of view, which makes it very difficult for independent courts to exist, for example, uh, or a multiplicity of actors, or competition, or pluralism. And in that situation, our reforms and our promises that things will get better remind me of a political joke which is very popular in Russian today. It's a very brief, this joke. The, uh, somebody who would, uh, asks the doctor, where are you taking me in the ambulance? And the doctor says, to the morgue. But I am not dead yet, says the patient. Uh, and, the, and the answer from the doctor was, well, we're not at the morgue yet. We haven't got there yet. Actually, do you remember I had a Russian teacher who uh, said, told a similar thing. Actually, it was true. Her, her, uh, she stopped getting her paycheck, and she called up, and they said, why? And, they, and she said, well, you didn't tell us you weren't dead. So it was very odd. Anyway, um, I wanted to ask the question, uh, Mr. Rishkov. We, uh, the idea was brought up that a lot of the Russian citizens aren't satisfied with reforms. They aren't in favor. Um, is that the case? And, and is there more the government should be doing? Well, for me, as, as a liberal, the question of social reform is at the same time very important and very difficult. There's no question that the government and Alexander Zhukov uh, quite rightly say that it is an abnormal situation where half the country's inhabitants um, use city transport, use uh, public transport free of charge. But the question is, how, was the, how were these decisions taken and how they are being carried out? And I think in both of these processes you can see all of the failings of the monopolistic system uh, which still exists in Russia today. You've got this paradox. The government says we're in favor of pluralism in the economy and yet has no objections whatever to monopol monopolism in politics. So when the social reforms were being discussed, there was no possibility for us in Parliament to uphold or to defend an alternative view, because in Parliament today the constitutional majority is the President's party. So this mechanism whereby the government introduces a bill and almost without amendment it is then approved by Parliament, and all of this is done in a period of three months and it affects tens of millions of people. This is not the kind of mechanism which is going to help us to preclude social tensions and protests. And, and so far as the contents of reform is concerned, why are they so unpopular? They are unpopular for one simple reason, because a lot of things have not been taken into account. Because of the way the decisions were taken, a very small group of people elaborated the reforms, and then the parliament simply supported it because it supports anything that the government puts before it. For these reasons, an awful lot was forgotten about and was not taken into account. For example, it turned out that in most, in most cities, people are simply not able to live because at one of the same time, they have to pay for municipal transport 
transport, for suburban transport as well. Um, uh, they pro problems with paying for the telephone, uh, paying for their the rates. The rents have been increased. Uh, the rates have been increased for municipal and uh, uh, suburban transport, and yet their pensions are still at the same level. And millions of people have gotten not even not a copeck in addition of extra money, and yet their outgoings have sharply increased. Now I think that if the political system in Russia were better balanced. If it were possible in Parliament to have a, a real discussion and to correct draft legislation, then I think I, I think that there has to be a better idea of the of the social reforms. But it has to be done in such a way that millions of people, maybe tens of millions of people in the country today. Uh, who, who are really suffering from this should not suffer. And if the government does need very quickly and urgently to take uh, corrective measures, such as, for example, to reintroduce uh, uh, travel passes or to increase pensions or to increase compensation payments in compensation, to take... But unfortunately, dear friends, the trust has already been broken. Trust has already been undermined. And it seems to me, and I tried to say this earlier in my third point, that a political system where decisions are taken by a very small number of people without any broad discussion in society, without any corrections or amendments on the, from the parliament, without consideration of alternatives, that is a very dangerous system. And it is it, very similar decisions were taken about Ukraine. Nobody took part in the discussion uh, about Ukraine. The decision was taken in the Kremlin, not by the parliament, not by the political parties, not by the economic interest group. Groups. None of these parties or stakeholders was involved in a discussion of what the proper Russian attitude to, to Ukraine should be. And even the people who are closest to us today uh, are, are now further away from us than they were six months ago. So to sum up, I think I can say that uh, I think we have an absolutely incorrect decision-making mechanism in where, where there is such a monopoly of power. And this means that there are many systematic mistakes are made which could have been avoided. Thank you. Mr. Duco. Well, I'd like to draw attention to two facts or two myths, if you like, which are very often heard in regard to the political situation in today's Russia. In Russia, for more than 10 years, there was an absolutely absurd situation whereby Parliament was, in essence, in opposition to the government. In Parliament, there was a majority of left-wing parties, while the government was carrying through liberal and market-oriented reforms. And as a result, absolutely absurd laws were, were passed, which are impossible to implement. And, and the government, uh, for all practical purposes, never has implemented them. So this was simply deception of the people. Uh, there was a left-wing parliament which adopted laws that could not be implemented, so the government doesn't implement them. And for the first time in this parliament, we now have a normal situation which you would find in any civilized country whereby there is a parliamentary majority which supports the government. That is a normal situation in any country. And of course, the parliamentary majority adopts the bills that are put to it by the government. That is an absolutely normal and correct situation because there is mutual responsibility then for decision making. Both the parliament and the executive executive arm of government share the responsibility for, for legislation. And of course, the opposition, just as in any other country, the opposition is going to vote against laws, uh, which say two plus two is four. Um, again, this is absolutely normal. And the same thing happens in our country. So, to, talk, to tell all kinds of stories and all kinds of fables about what's, what's to be found in our legislation. You should remember that for the first, uh, first time, we have dared to adopt legislation which is extremely unpopular. And of course, the government's uh, ratings uh, decline in consequence. But this is only possible when you have political 
uh, forces and a government which, are, which take responsibility. They know that they have a responsibility to carry through uh, unpopular reforms because they are essential. That is the essence of the political situation in Russia today. And this is something which wasn't possible at all in previous years. That's the first point. And secondly, as concerns uh, freedom of speech in Russia, I don't think there's a single country in the world today where the press, uh, almost the whole of the print media, finds itself in, in opposition to the power, in harsh opposition to the power. Only somebody who hasn't read the newspapers in recent years uh, could, could say that there was no freedom of the press in Russia. You're not going to find, you couldn't possibly find any tougher criticism uh, of the government's reform efforts you, than you, any, any, uh, any country of the world. And if you look at uh, the television, uh, nationwide television channels, you'll also see very tough criticism, very harsh criticism of the government. There are all kinds of meetings being held today in, in Russia. Uh, uh, and yet th 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 there's been no tough action against the people demonstrating in the streets, although they are demonstrating under opposition banners. These are normal democratic procedures. This is a normal political struggle that is taking place in Russia. And this whole nonsense about our moving towards totalitarianism, uh, towards a restriction, a curtailment of rights and freedoms of citizens, there's absolutely no grounds for this. I can see a lot of eyebrow raising over here, but I want to give either Mr. Belt or Mr. Browder an opportunity to either make a comment or um, uh, ask a question. Mr. Belt? Um, well, you know, there's a, there's a saying that you should never tell jokes, foreigners do not tell jokes on the Queen. And uh, therefore, you should never extend examples from one country to another. I come from Brazil, uh, so it's, um, we've just spent a day discussing the problems of democracy in South America, the problems of corruption, the problems of flight of capital, uh, and all of the same discussions. And over the years, over the last 20, 30 years in my country, uh, we've been earning democracy, which meant that the different parties had to eventually own power and learn how to share power and eventually get to a, a position where we have today a uh, president who was a labor union leader, uh, which uh, five, ten years ago nobody would vote for, and is making the same kind of movements that you are doing in Russia today in the social area, confronting uh, social uh, problems of the past. And uh, it is, uh, it's not popular. Also, it's not as extreme as the examples you have. So um, the problem with the, all of these things is that democracy is a process when it goes well, when you have macroeconomics in place, which you have in Russia today, is a two step forward, one step back process. And uh, it's not happy. It takes time and time, unfortunately, on the history of the country is nothing in my lifetime it is all I have. So uh, when uh, one of our presidents decided to build a new capital in Brazil in 1956, uh, the fear was he was going to destroy the economy with enormous inflation, which he did. Uh, and he says, uh, it will cost the country 20 years. And he says, what is 20 years in a country economy? It's nothing. But obviously, in my life, if I were in those days, uh, it was a lot of problem for me. And I think some of what you're discussing here are the same problems. They are the nature of the problem, the nature of privatization. I think I'm very encouraged by what you talked about, the privatization. Uh, we are a company that not only has made uh, uh, a first big investment in Russia at the moment, but we are willing to continue to make substantial investments on the basis of what we see today as the right mac macroeconomics and also the right microeconomics being put in place at a, at a cost. Uh, we understand the cost. We will pay the cost also because obviously there will be uncertainty, there will be insecurity, there will be all kinds of problems that we'll have to face. But we've seen that before. Bill, did you want to make one last uh, question or comment to any of the panelists? Um, 
Let me just say a couple of words and then ask a question to the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, the, um, I don't think as a foreigner, even though I live in Russia, that I'm qualified to make political um, statements or comments, nor, nor, nor should I comment about um, social security reform because those are issues that affect Russian people and don't affect me. But, but um, we are sitting here in an audience of international investors. And everyone sitting here watching all of this and wondering, is Russia a good place or a bad place to invest? And um, um, uh, Mr. Zhukov, I, I believe you when, when you say that um, there's freedom of the press because I've used the press in, in, in all sorts of corporate governance fights, attacking all sorts of people, including government officials, and there's never been any, any recourse coming back to me. And, and I also believe that Russia has a democratic process that's not going to go away, and various other myths I agree with you on. The problem is that a lot of other people don't. And um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the television show West Wing in America. It's a show about the president's office um, and how concerned they are about their public relations as much as they are about their decisions. And the one, the one big, big um, issue that I see in Russia right now is there's this enormous gap between perception and reality. And I don't see the Kremlin and the government doing that much to try to uh, bridge that gap. And um, the fact that you're here is a great thing, but what, what, other, what other things are you going to be doing to try to um, make it more clear that, that we don't have a crisis situation in Russia, but in fact things are going pretty well? Can you reply to that? And perhaps you should just get together with Martin Soro while he's here. Well, yes, I uh, uh, try to do that, but you're right in part. Last year, we had about a 40% rise in the securities market, in the stock market in Russia. And that's a kind of additional, but there wasn't any need for additional advertisement or propaganda to attract investors. When you see a 7% annual growth rate in our increase in our gold and currency to $125 billion equivalent, these figures speak for themselves, and so does the investment rating enjoyed by Russia. These are, these are objective indicators. Uh, which investors are used to make are used to using for their for their guidance. So I, I recognize that there has been a kind of hysteria about a weakening in the protection of ownership or of property in Russia. But that's going to be sorted out. And I'd like to repeat what I said before. There are no plans to renationalize things in Russia. There's, there, there, that doesn't exist. And as concerns the judicial system, the judiciary, it's true that the judiciary in Russia is far from perfect, to put it mildly. We can see this, and we are trying to change the situation. A decision has just now been taken to, to double the salaries of judges, and we believe that this will, could, this will tend to reduce the proneness to corruption of the courts. All decisions, all court decisions uh, also uh, are, are going to be published and are going to be open, open, transparent to society. That's another change. And I think some judges who might uh, otherwise be tempted to, to take improper or incorrect decisions uh, they have, that's got to be stopped. We, we, we are very well aware of our, of our drawbacks and our, and our, our failings. And, uh, of course, we hope we're not saying that our reforms are necessarily going to all work perfectly. All we're saying is that we can see the things that are wrong. We're trying to correct them. And I can't agree with those who say that things are getting worse, that the situation is deteriorating across the board. Sure, things aren't always moving forward as rapidly as we would like. Of course, things are holding back the rate of economic growth. Uh, and if the administrative and judicial reforms could proceed more rapidly in our country, maybe we would be making not just 7 percent, maybe we'd, we would, we'd be making 10 or even 15 percent growth rates. But let me just repeat, in every country, 
a point comes where the emphasis maybe needs to be placed on one, two, or three principal reforms, and the others can be put on the back burner for a while. And we've come to that point now. We've reached that period where it's not enough just to reform the economy. Macroeconomic stabilization by itself is not alone. We have to think about the quality of human capital. This means that we need to reform education, we have to reform health, we have to introduce normal market principles there. We have to try to ensure that those spheres, those sectors function more effectively. And that is going to re require an enormous amount of money and it's also going to require a very serious explanations to the population. We can understand. We, we know that has to be done. We know it has to be done quickly. But you can't do everything overnight. Uh, as concerns the mood of society uh, and the inflow and outflow of capital, I think various different countries go through all of these phases. It's almost like seasonal fluctuations of influxes and outfluxes. So, talking about the outflow of capital from Russia in this year and saying that it's going to be below $10 billion at a time when the trade balance in Russia has risen to $60 billion. We have a, we have a $60 billion surplus, the difference between imports, exports and imports. It means that we can accumulate part of this, part of this uh, it goes to bolster our reserves, part of it, of course, uh, moves out of Russia again. Is it, but again, there's nothing abnormal about this. Uh, if you look, into, look at it in terms of macroeconomic theory, you don't have to put this down to some crisis of investor confidence in Russia. If you look at the figures for net increase, in uh, direct, foreign direct investment in Russia, you can, you can see that, uh, that things are moving in the right direction. Sure, you're right to say that Russia needs to be more concerned about its image. It needs perhaps to set up special programs to ensure that. Uh, but a, an attentive investor, an investor who, uh, who works in Russia today, uh, can draw his own correct conclusions about all this. Thank you. I want to open this to the floor. We've, we've, we um, are cutting our, our questions from the floor a little bit shorter, but I want to give everybody up in the panel a chance to go back and forth. Um, when you, uh, can we have a question over here to the right, and can you identify yourself as well, please? Katrin Bennell from the International Herald Tribune. I have a question uh, for the panel, uh, for Mrs. Shevtsova and Mr. Shukov in particular. Um, we're seeing very clearly, if we're looking at the list of topics at Davos this year, that Russia has gone somewhat off the radar screen, and this is obviously what this discussion is in part about. China and India are much more on the radar. And my question is, to what extent is this a limited window of opportunity for Russia to get itself back on track? Whether or not it's just a matter of perception or reality, but the fact is there is a crisis in confidence. Do you think that um, you know, the next decade or even five to ten years are crucial to the extent that investments that right now as a new economic world map is emerging, if you like, uh, Western investors are putting their eggs into Asia and maybe into Brazil. Are there potential lock-in effects that will harm Russia and make it more difficult in five to ten years uh, to sort of succeed as one of the BRIC countries that only two years ago was still mentioned in the same breath as the other two economies that I mentioned. Thanks. Very briefly. Russia is in the epicenter of attention, not only in Davos. This is happening elsewhere, too, in other fora. When there is a crisis in Russia, either Russia is seen as an extraordinarily successful country, but uh, Russia is on the outs today, and I think and uh, Russia is seen as uh, moving into a period of stagnation. I can assure you that in three or four years' time, Russia will once again be at the epicenter. It's either a crisis or it's, uh, it's, it's seen as a success story. There seem to be no other possibilities. 
Uh, Mr. Zhukov, do you feel that Russia's fallen off the map in terms of competition between particularly India and China? Well, I, I was going to agree with Mrs. Shevtsova to saying that the history of Davos has been that Russia found itself at the center of attention twice, the f first time when the whole world understood that uh, there were radical reforms taking place in Russia and that Russia was moving from being a uh, communist country to becoming a, a democratic country, uh, building a market economy. And the interest in Russia, of course, was quite natural as a new member of the world community. There was extremely keen interest in that. The second time Russia found itself uh, at the center of attention was, was that the, the default in 1998. Now, today, Russia is in the center of attention, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing because it means that the situation in Russia today is stable, is pretty stable, that Russia is developing normally. And that's why it isn't finding itself the focus of everybody's attention. France or England or some other country may, may be drawing attention. Iraq, Afghanistan are attracting much more attention. Yes, it's true that China, too, China is, uh, is showing marvelous rates of economic growth. And, of course, everybody, the whole world wants to analyze and see what's going on there. But I don't... Uh, I don't suppose Russia will always be in the, 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 the situation at Davos that it is this year. Question here in the front. Hi. Um, Craig Kapitas from Bloomberg News. Uh, one is reminded of... A U.S. ambassador to Moscow, Chip Boland's statement, uh, never trust anyone who tells you they don't get drunk on champagne or can tell you what's going to happen in Russia. With that in mind, I'd like to know from Mr. Zhukov and Mr. Rushkov, have we reached a point now in Moscow, in Russia, where a businessman who has paid his taxes can put as much money as he wants into an opposition, opposition candidate or candidates without fear of jail? or other persecution by the government. And I'd like to hear from both of you on that point, if we've reached that point. Well, no, so long as nobody is giving money to the opposition, we haven't yet reached that position. Secondly, as concerns freedom of the press, we've got 10 Moscow newspapers, uh, the 10 biggest uh, uh, don't reach uh, circulations of 100,000 in a country of 140 million people. So it is, it is countrywide federal television uh, that people get their news from, and not one of those television channels is fully is independent or gives a full picture of what's going on in the country, uh, particularly as concerns the monetization of benefits and the protests, the street protests uh, in response. There, has, there have been instructions, don't show more than two meetings each evening uh, in the news coverage, although in fact uh, there have been tens of meetings, dozens of meetings of this kind. So, uh, uh, let me say, I would very much hope that the priorities we've heard about from uh, Alexander Zhukov, I very much hope they'll become a reality. And, and I'll be the first to support those in Parliament. And I will be the first to say that we support the government's efforts to build a, a, a democratic political system and a market economy. But I understand that for the moment, unfortunately, that remains a very distant reality. And our understanding of uh, what is said in the official organs. I think Russia's image it, it, it suffers very much from the fact that young people and jurists from the legal department of UCOS who have, they have a three- and seven-year-old children find themselves arrested. Now, that's something which has happened very recently, uh, too, where a group of uh, members from the Council of Federation 
say that a very large group of investors had failed to pay 22 billion rubles to the Russian Treasury. And I think that every day there are news items of this kind. And it is this kind of thing which tends to undermine Russia's reputation. Mr. Zhukov, uh, can uh, one contribute to the opposition parties if you've paid your taxes? Indeed. Of course, in accordance with our legislation, various parties can accumulate various funds and, of course, they can receive donations from business and it's happening at every election campaign. This is perfectly legal and normal. There are no problems here. Moreover, almost every single party, and in particular those represented in the parliament, including left-wing parties, they all have people that have come there from large business. They continue to co-own, to have shares in large companies, and of course take part in financing these parties. Back of the room. I'm Maria Vlasova, the co-chair of the Healthcare Committee in the American Chamber of Commerce in Moscow. Um, three years ago, we put together a report on the status of Russian healthcare. And we said that uh, after uh, complete, uh, completing uh, radical reforms in the area of taxes, macroeconomics, one of the most uh, unreformed sectors of the entire Russian economy was healthcare. And three years ago, when we put together this report and distributed it to the presidential administration, to the Russian government, we couldn't have hoped uh, for the radicalness of the reforms that the Russian government announced last year in the area of healthcare. I think the significance and the scope for, of the reform of the healthcare that uh, is just being launched by the Russian government is yet uh, not understood uh, either inside the country or outside the country. And um, if uh, completed, uh, as it's been announced uh, over the course of several years, it will have a lasting long-term impact on the quality of life and uh, on the overall uh, economic situation in Russia. Um, we heard uh, this morning from Chancellor Schroeder, he said that uh, when uh, they are in, their, in Germany, they suggested to uh, just uh, ask people to contribute a very small amount to their healthcare costs budget from their private insurance or out of pocket. Uh, the people in Germany got into pre revolutionary mood. So it's no wonder that when uh, the uh, system of healthcare benefits is undergoing restructuring, of course there will be opposition, and of course people will uh, try to look for uh, ways to retain their uh, previous benefits that they inherited from the Soviet system. Um, but just also to add to what Mr. Zhukov was saying, indeed, the Russians uh, were not paying for their housing or for their transportation costs or a, a substantial number of the population. Same was true in healthcare. Uh, uh, the people were declared to get uh, benefits in terms of medical services, in terms of drugs, but they were not really getting uh, those, uh, the quality healthcare that uh, they deserve to have. Um, but it, it is a very controversial area, and every country in the world today is, fa is faced with the challenge of reforming uh, the health care costs. So my question to uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Zhukov is, uh, what's your sort of long-term vision in terms of uh, the health care financing? Say, five years from now, what would be the role of state sources of financing, medical insurance, as opposed to the uh, development of private insurance, whether it be 50-50%, 50% government, 50% private insurance? What are the prospects and what is the best model you, you feel would be for Russia to have? Mr. Zhukov. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the support you've expressed to Russian reforms which are underway today and for an impartial view of those reforms. Healthcare reform is a separate and a huge topic. We could discuss it forever. All I can say is that, of course, healthcare requires a very, very deep and wide-ranging reform. Unfortunately, we've inherited this from the Soviet times totally unreformed. We have health insurance, both compulsory and voluntary. But sadly, the system is just goes on and fun all it does is financing medical clinics and other establishments. What we'd like to do is introduce proper 
health insurance, there will be a, a required minimum, a standard minimum of medical services paid for by the state, and everybody in the country will be eligible for these services. As far as anything of higher quality, any other medical services will be paid for through health insurance, mainly through voluntary health insurance. Of course, the reform of, of this system would be another very painful social reform. We shall, of course, tackle it, but first we must finish with what we've started. I think we'll take one more question. Right here in the middle. And could you identify yourself, please? Ruben Ardanyan, Troika Dialogue, Investment Bank. After 15 years of reforms and this transition period in Russia, there isn't a single business school in Russia yet. You are planning to reform our education system. It requires serious reform indeed, but I think there is a separate issue of selecting elite, high-quality, very professional staff to work in such business schools. Now we're talking about Russia's future. In Davos, we always talk about today and tomorrow. We mustn't ignore this problem in Russia and to hope that it will be solved all by itself at some point in time. What kind of plans do you have in government? And what kind of dialogue do you have in government with private sector to sort out our education system? Thank you for your question. Yes, indeed. Many of our people have been trained in Western business schools. We have two projects aimed at creating very high-level business schools in Russia. I mean, there are very many, all kinds of business schools in Russia, but sadly, uh, the, the training that they provide is not sufficient. People that graduate are not well-trained yet. So we have programs, and we think that the issue of training and the issue of reforming the entire education system is one of the most important ones for us. Today, large and developing Russian companies who are competing in the international markets today quite successfully, those who are largest players, each in their own field, in uh, steel, power, oil and energy, etc., they are experiencing shortage of well-qualified staff in Russia. It is becoming a big problem. At the moment, they are training people themselves. Uh, but business in Russia is developing. We can see it. And uh, if uh, today we just uh, are experiencing accelerated development of large companies, we're trying to create good environment for SMEs to develop. And of course, we'll need more highly trained people. You're quite right. I think that's it. That's all we have time for. Thank you, everybody on the panel, and thank you in the audience very much.